Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So how are you guys doing? Welcome to the sixth session here uh, in this very important critical seerah, intellectual seerah that we're going through. And today we're going to go be going through something very important and very topical, very relevant, very pertinent, something which relates to what's happening today in Gaza. And one of the things which I think has most significance to what's happening in Gaza vis-a-vis -vis the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is the torture uh, of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and of the companions uh, at the time of Mecca and really I would say there's two things that really can we can we can think about in terms of the seerah which relate most in my estimation my opinion to what's happening in Gaza today and in Palestine one of them is this uh, one of them is this uh, the Palestinian issue uh, the the early Meccan period and the torture that happened with that and the other one is in fact uh, the battle of Lahzab or Khandaq which we're going to be going through as well, we're going to be speaking about that as well in later episodes. But this is the first one. And before we get started, let's just take a look at the lineage of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the first uh, slide, because this is something we try to memorize. But memorization is useless unless you try and look over and over again at the same material. So this is at least try and memorize. We said the first five names of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's lineage. Uh, so just maybe quickly take a look at that. Pause the screen if you're if you're uh, watching at home. Now, moving on, the objective of this particular lesson is the following. Number one, we're going to be looking at some of the background information relating to A, the overt da'wah, da'wah bijahr, as they mentioned in the Qutb of Sirah, the overt da'wah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that we're going to quickly touch upon some of the important aspects of the relationship with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Talib. And then we're going to analyze the events of the torture in the Meccan period. What we're going to be doing, which is different, and this is why this is the critical part, if you want, the criticality that we're going to employ to this particular uh, talking point is A, we're going to be looking at the spiritual benefits of trauma. Now, this word trauma is a word which many people use now has become a buzzword, especially in the age of mental health, to, and this may be an overgeneralization, but crude as it may be, to mention the inconveniences of their life, words like trauma, Words like narcissist, words like toxic. This is, these are the words that we, we're hearing nowadays in modern day psychological uh, parlance. Now, I don't mean this word trauma in that context. When we use the word trauma, we're talking about an actual tragedy that takes place, which is of a significant level. And what I want to do is we want to look at what's going on in terms of the, tra the trauma, the real trauma, the true trauma, uh, with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions, uh, and then we want to see what the benefits of such trauma could be. And you could, you could kind of analogize onto that any kind of difficulty that may happen in your life. And the same principle for the most part will apply. The second thing is I want to look at the psychological theories. And in particular, we're going to look at resilience. Now, the word sabr in the Arabic language is loosely translated into patience. But another translation, another possible translation, which I think nowadays we can look at in, in terms of translating this word, sabr, is resilience, really. Because sabr and resilience, as we're going to talk about, especially in the psychological context, is the ability to cope with a tragic event. The ability to cope with a tragic event and to get to the pre-tragedy um, status. We'll see some of the definitions of the word resilience, trauma, and all these kind of things, and we'll connect them and see where the similarities and differences are between the Islamic approaches to psychology and the secular approaches to psychology. And I think this is the best place to nestle this kind of discussion within the seerah, because there are many approaches in the West which have become famous and have become uh, most used. And they actually they become methods or prescribed methods by which and through which many people live. For example, uh, nowadays, if someone feels bad, what do they do? They go to the doctor, right? And they, the, they say, I have depression. So the, the, the doctor will say to him, listen, have some antidepressant medicines, you know, for example. And there's another fork in the road, which is that you can have your antidepressant medicines. This will help your chemical imbar imbalances. This will fix your neurological process. This, these are the neurotransmitters will be fixed. Another way of doing it is to say, well, why don't you do a CBT course? cognitive behavioral therapy or why don't you do the talking cure why don't you go to a counselor 
Now, we're not dismissing any of or all of those things. We're saying, let's see where the similarities and differences are between the Islamic method of doing things in terms of psychological approach and the Western or the secular psychological method. This is an important discussion um, and one I don't think people have on this meta level and we're nestling this in the context of the seerah. So that's another thing that we want to get done here and of course as we're going along we're going to relate these things to the current events in Gaza and other such life traumas that may people may have. So the first thing we want to go through is the following. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after we, we mentioned in the previous session, we mentioned that he, how he uh, received revelation, we mentioned how he went to the cave, we mentioned how the story of the, you know, how he received revelation. Then there was a phase and so there was the private revelation. He went to the, his wife and he said, Zamiluni, Zamiluni, cover me, cover me. And, and we went through that. After that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down an ayah وَأَنذِرْ عَشِرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ It's in Surah Al-Shu'ara, the 26th Surah of the Qur'an, which is, and proclaim to your close family. Proclaim the message to your close family. وَأَنذِرْ عَشِرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ So it went from a private matter to now the, the circle is being expanded to the family. And in fact, if you look at the story uh, behind Surah Al-Shu'ara or the narrative in that particular chapter is talking about Moses actually and the stages by which and through which Moses took vis-a-vis -vis Pharaoh and he started in the same way he started with his family then his community and then it became a message so he's slowly widening the circle uh, he's not jumping straight into it there is a kind of gradualist process that is being taken and of course the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had his uncle Abu Talib, who we haven't mentioned yet, but his, his uncle Abu Talib was very beloved to him and he was very beloved to his uncle. And his uncle Abu Talib really acted as the guarantor or the protector in that particular community. And it's very interesting because actually, this, there is a parallel here between us and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi situation. I'll tell you what the situation is, especially us living in the West. The parallel is, the parallel is we are for the most part protected by our citizenships. Let's just call a spade a spade. We, wouldn't, we have a specific mission and we have a specific opportunity here in the West to speak freely about certain issues which many, in many parts of the Muslim world, in fact, there's more than 50 Muslim majority countries, we wouldn't be able to have this opportunity. And that's not because of our religion, but it's because of our citizenships to these particular countries. And in fact, I would postulate that maybe in places like London, where we're living, it's probably one of the most free places where we can give dawah and Birmingham as well. I know you guys come from Birmingham and other parts in the UK, but other parts of the West where you can give dawah in the entire world. So we have a special responsibility, in fact, because we have the protection of these, of these things. And this reminds me of an ayah in the Quran in Surah Hud where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrates what Shu'aib says to his people. Arahti is my tribe more mighty to you than Allah? The ayah is saying that Shu'aib is saying, I'm, I know I'm being protected here because of my tribe. And he's criticizing this fact because he's saying that really what you should be doing is fearing Allah. But he didn't. He didn't unpragmatically not use that. Many people will say from the right wings, I say, you guys are you know, using the freedoms. That are, you know, yes, we are using the freedom. Why shouldn't we use them? We have a mission and we will use every freedom just like everyone else in society. There's no doesn't go against our ethics and our morals to proclaim our message uh, in this way. So we're finding ourselves in a similar situation where the Abu Talib, our Abu Talib, who also happens to be a disbeliever, is say, for example, the United Kingdom. But we might not have the same love for him as the Prophet had for his uncle, because obviously he was, and this, as you may know, the, the ayah came down, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبَتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاء That you're not going to guide whoever you want, but Allah guides whomever he wants. So Abu Talib, as we know, even though he was there for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and so on, he died upon kufr and disbelief which shows you 
that once again, going back to the principles we talked about in the very first session, that this is not meant to be some kind of rosy and romantic picture of everything that happens in the seerah. These are real events, unfortunately. Allah guides whom he wants and he misguides whom he wants. And this whole event shows you that, uh, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, there is one dua, and this might sound controversial to many of you, that might, might not be accepted by the Prophet, which is the dua of guidance. If Allah does not intend guidance for somebody. Because if that dua was accepted and Allah, the Prophet ﷺ made dua for everyone to be guided and that didn't happen, that means Allah, the Prophet ﷺ has exactly the same power as Allah. So there is, this is the only kind of dua, the supplication that you can imagine. With, and you can imagine the Prophet ﷺ made, surely he made dua for his uncle. Yes? Not, not just dua, also when the Prophet ﷺ is taken, when he made dua against certain people, Allah sent wahi, saying that again. It's not, uh, I don't know who it was for. Yes. Um, I don't know the companion's name, but he made a dua against him and Allah reminded him that it's not a yeah, I mean, the, the ayah is clear. I mean, You're not going to guide whoever you want. Yes. Allah has taken sovereignty of the situation here. This, the issue of guidance goes back to Allah at the end of the day. The issue of guidance, because if, 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 if a human... Though. Pardon? Even punishment. Yes, punishment. Uh, yeah. Someone going into heaven, going into hell. This is the sovereignty of Allah. Like, So that's one thing, I would say. Uh, so Abu Talib, it's interesting that he actually was pressured so much by his community that he came to the Prophet. And there are different hadiths of this, and so I just want to tell you, you know, this, there's one particular hadith of if you were to put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left. I don't know if that's sahih. I think that's a weak one, but a very similar one has been narrated, which is the following, which is sahih, which is... Uh, Sorry, what's the number of that one? Uh, we're on the fourth slide here. Fourth slide, Abu Talib's involvement. So, in the fourth slide, um, he says, in the, in the fourth slide, as you can see here, uh, Abu Talib says, do you see, so the Prophet is saying to Abu Talib, do you see the sun? Is what he's saying. He said, do you see the sun over there? He said, yes. And it wasn't just Abu Talib, it was, uh, it was a crowd of people. He said, I cannot, yeah, stop proclaiming what I'm proclaiming as much as I can take a flame from this particular sun. In other words, just, I have as much ability to control whether or not I'm going to proclaim this message as I have management of the sun, the celestial sphere, which is so far away from us. So in other words, he was not going to accept any of the, uh, he's not going to accept any of the offers. And so it's true that a lot of them came to him with offers, and these are narrated uh, uh, authentically, like with money and prestige and status and stuff, and he rejected that, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, for the cause and for the message. And there was a very interesting, and you can see this on, on slide number five, a very interesting uh, interaction between Walid ibn Mughira and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Walid ibn Mughira is the father of whom? Khalid ibn Walid. And he came to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, uh, and actually, in fact, they, they decided, look, let's get our, one of our best guys, our best speakers to speak to the Prophet. Yeah. So this is Walid. Because you can imagine, like Khalid and Walid is like, you know, the best, they say, he, even the non-Muslims, I mean, they say he's the best uh, military general of all times. Lost. Some say he's, he's never lost. I mean, he's, he's, he's the best mili military general of all time. There's actually a, an interesting Harvard lecture that's online. This guy was speaking about Khalid and Walid Roy for an hour. What's his name? Dr. Roy Casagrande. Thank you very much for that. That was excellent uh, input there. And he, he makes the point, he makes the argument. I think he says he's one of the top three of all time, just yeah. to be clear. I mean, a lot of them say he's a top three, but you can imagine what kind of family he comes from because he comes from the family of Walid and he was a very self, like a prideful man. But for him, it wasn't necessarily the military prowess. It was his uh, eloquence that he was very, you know, prideful of. So he went there and um, he, he says there's no one in this town that is better than me in share in in poetry and when i heard the quran remember this guy is an enemy of islam he's the one that i ask ayat of the quran came down you know th these ayahs came down about him so, yeah and he literally he's a very very belligerent man he said look there's no one that's better at poetry than me no one's better than that. 
And what I heard is not poetry. He's talking about the Quran. He said, what I heard about the Quran, that's not poetry. And then he started praising the Quran. He said that it has a softness to it. And that there's nothing better than it. You know, and everything, everything below it is destroyed. Like he was praising it. So they decided, what am I going to say? Then? What are we going to say about the Quran? If, it's, if we're not going to say it's poetry, what can we say? So he started trying to spin at the Prophet ﷺ and say it's, he, he must be a magician. And by the way, by saying he's a magician, you're acknowledging there's something supernatural about what's going on. We can't explain it. Anything inexplicable must be explained through these things which we can't explain. Magic is a very interesting label. So yes, he was there and he made that, uh, uh, made that point. I want to actually skip uh, to quickly to, to slide 9 and I'll come back. Yeah, so we're going to slide 9. And there's another very interesting incident. So we've got the, the best Shah, the most eloquent guy. And then we have the best debater effectively is Rabia. Ibn Atba, yeah? So they sent him to the Prophet ﷺ. He was like, you know, the, the, the top debater of the, the, of the place. He was the Muhammad Hijab of the place. <laughs> Even though I don't want to compare myself with this, astaghfirullah, this kafir, this, this, this horrendous uh, person. He's just the Sabur Ahmad of the place, right? <laughs> but I was going to say, uh, so basically, um, he tried to, uh, where is it? Nine, yeah? This is Rabia. So he went to, this is very interesting, Wallahi, this, this thing here is, before we get into today's discussion, I think this is a very interesting, um, like, in, in debates, there's three things. There's arguments, there's strategies, and there's tactics, okay? D these three, and they're different. There's arguments, you make your arguments, there's strategies, that you make your strategy, and then your tactics. So this guy, he clearly knew what he was doing. He came to the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said to him, who's better, you or Abdullah? Abdullah is whom? His father. Okay, but this is very interesting, right? Because in Arab culture, if you say I'm better than, I'm better than my dad. I mean, the Quran says, فَذْكُرُوا كَذِكْرِكُمْ آبَائِكُمْ أَوْ أَشَدَّ ذِكْرَ That, you know, the, 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 they used to really mention their forefathers and stuff. To say that we're better than our forefathers, this was seen as a no-go. There's no chance. You can't say that. So he said, who's better, you or your father? He said... So the Prophet ﷺ didn't respond. Which shows you the first thing. Rabia, he knew tactically the best thing to do in the beginning of the debate is what? Ask a question. And I know you're all smiling because, <laughs> because I do that, right? Especially with people that you know are going to ask you questions. You come in and you ask them the question first. You throw the first punch. So as soon as he saw the Prophet ﷺ, who's better you? Yeah, he had that in his mind. He wanted to jam him. He wanted to jam the Prophet because whoever asked the question has got the, the initiative, he's got the power. It's like throwing the first punch, you're forcing your opponent to defend. What did the Prophet ﷺ do? He stayed quiet, he didn't, answer, he didn't answer the question. Now this is a master stroke. Because if you think about it, and I've thought about this quite a lot. SubhanAllah, you don't need to answer every question. That's the mistake we make. We think we have to answer every question. The Prophet ﷺ knew it was a trap question and he stayed quiet. And what that does is it portrays an image of this belligerent, this emotional person asking the question. And then he didn't get a response. So he, he, he goes further. He goes, because if you say this, then this. And if you say this, then this. And the Prophet's not responding. He's acting in a stoic manner. He's not, uh, he's not, he's not budging. He's not taking the bait. Sallallahu Which shows you, subhanAllah, tactically, how the Prophet was able to circumnavigate this behavior of Rabia. Now, it gets interesting here because I want to just make one point which is connected to this. There's two ways of dealing with questions that are meant to be paradoxical or meant to trap you. A, you can decide not to answer them. But there's something in the Quran is called At-Tariqatul Hakima. You could answer them and give some of the answer but then take it to a narrative which you like. Let me give you an example. Allah mentioned in the Quran, yes, alunaka anil ahilla. And the reason why I'm bringing the Qur'an to the equation is because the best way to deal with questions and answers, which is an integral part of debates and stuff, and eloquence and rhetoric, is actually the Qur'an itself. If, you, if we believe that the Qur'an is the most balir, most rhetorical book in the world, yet we don't want to see how the Qur'an deals with certain things relating to rhetoric, relating to polemics, then how much do we actually believe the Qur'an is the most rhetorical book on the earth? So they asked him, the Quran says, yes, They ask you about the new moons. New moons. Now, when they were asking about the new moons, 
They weren't, ans they weren't asking what the Quran answered them. The Quran answered them, قُلْ هِيَ مَوَاقِيتُ لِلنَّاسِ وَالْحَجِّ That the new moons are stages for the people of يعني, things you can see the times for the people, calculations for the people to see the times, and for you to know when Hajj is. So what happened is the Quran was taking a question and it answered it. Yes, it did answer it. It answered the question, but in a way which fulfills a narrative which is to do with guidance. Because all these other things are a waste of time, as Sabur would say, they're distractions. They're distractions. So Allah doesn't entertain their frivolity. He takes what they say and he responds in a manner to bring it back to the narrative of guidance which the Quran does. And this happens, by the way, a lot. It's, the the Balaghiyin, the rhetoricians, they refer to this as a tariqa al hakima the wise way, effectively, of answering questions. So it's not, not answering the question, it's answering the question, but in the way that I want to answer the question. The, the way that suits my narrative. I'm not going to go down your silly questions which, which lead me to a dead end and me looking like a fool because we know what you're trying to do. Questions are the most dangerous thing and the Prophet Sallallahu how he dealt with this is phenomenal because he didn't answer that, stayed stoic and then he recited the Quran. And in fact he recited the first you know, three or four ayahs of Surah Fussilat. Hamim Fussilat chapter 41, you can look at your own time. It's a very powerful ayat. And Rabia went back and he was shocked and he was scared because it was it, it was threatening. A lot of it was threatening. If you look at the ayahs, it's like threatening of the, of the hellfire and so on, or adab, or, or of, a, of a punishment of some sorts. So, this shows you how to deal with belligerence. We will go back now to. Um, so these are some of the things that happened before, like we would go on to the torture. We're now uh, we're in um, PowerPoint slide number six. So this is a hadith. Arwa uh, ibn Zubair, who, to my knowledge, was not a Sahabi, but he was a Tabi, right? He said, he asked Abdullah ibn Amr about the worst incident of aggression and hostility that he saw on the part of the Prophet. Now, this doesn't mean this is the worst thing that happened to the Prophet. Just It's the worst thing that he saw, if that makes sense. So what did you see that was the worst thing? He said, I saw Uqba. Uh, come to the Prophet and he put a rida around his neck and tried to, to choke him basically. And then after that, and that's a very cowardly move. Like let's be frank, if you want to fight somebody, you come to them face to face. But this man, because he's a coward, he came behind the Prophet and he tried to choke him as he was uh, prostrating. Then when Abu Bakr came, he pushed him away and said, would you kill a man just because he said my Lord is Allah and he's come with clear signs from your Lord? And that became an ayah, I mean, that, that is an ayah in the Qur'an. أَتَقَتُلُونَ رَجُلًا أَنْ يَقُولَ رَبِّيَ اللَّهِ Surah Ghafir, you know, chapter 40, verse 28. And it was narrated that Prophet Sallallahu said, By Allah, you will not stop until the punishment comes upon you. After that, he says to companions, Be of good cheer, for Allah. He basically went to, um, to them and he said, لَقَدْ جِئْتُكُمْ بِالذَّبْحَ I have come to you with slaughter. Now, this is... A controversial point, which means we have to follow it. These guys are torturing, not just the Prophet Muhammad As we know, Bilal ibn Rabah was tortured. You know, he was tortured very severely. Bilal ibn Rabah, for those who don't know, of course he was a slave. He was a black Abyssinian slave who was then freed by Abu Bakr siddiq The story is known. But he was tortured. The, the, rock, were put, the rock was put on him. He said, Ahadun Ahad. You know, the, everyone knows the, the story. He was tortured. Ammar ibn Yasir, he saw his mother, Sumayya, tortured. I mean, this is extremely excruciating how she was killed, where she was, you know, the, the spear was put into her private parts and he had to see this. And Ammar ibn uh, Yasir was then pushed and pressured to say words of kufr, you know, and disbelief. And the torture was happening throughout the entire city of Mecca with these new converts, which was new, a small band of people, to the point where we're going to talk about in the next session, they had to actually emigrate to Abyssinia. But this torture was happening, it was happening to all of them. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi the incident which we just talked about, and other incidents of severe torture and humiliation. However, this, when he said to them, actually I see this very interesting. 
First of all, Ibn Hajar Asqalani, as you know, he's one of the great scholars. He said that this is not talking about, because some, for example, Orientalists and right-wing people, they use this and say, look, your Prophet said, I have come to you with slaughter. Which shows you that you know he's a man of uh, violence and so on. Ibn Hajar said this is not a general statement. This is a statement that he was saying to those people who were torturing him. And this is what he says. Ibn Hajar says uh, in Fath al-Bari, as you can see here, the wording, I have brought slaughter to you, undoubtedly has sound meaning and it should not be cause, uh, cause confusion in the mind of the, the questioner or any other rational person. What is meant by slaughter here applies to a few specific individuals who were the ones who persisted in disbelieving Allah and waging war against Islam and its peoples, persecuting those who are weak position, oppressing women and old people among the believers in order to turn them away from their religion. But it's such a powerful thing because in fact I see this as a lot of people have this uh, narrative, another narrative, which is the, the words of, uh, of strength and of violence and of Izzah and all this kind of stuff it only came in the Medinan period. But that's not true. When the Prophet was being tortured, he said, I've come to you with slaughter. So this came in the Medi Meccan period when the torture was happening. Because the narrative that is, is usually brought, brought forward is that actually, uh, you know, the, 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 the harsh verses and the, and the strong words were only used in the Medinan period when the polity was formed. But we can find statements like this, which were clearly in the Meccan period, where the Prophet was showing authority, even though they were putting entrails on him, you know, the story of the entrails, of, of the, the guts of the, of the animal, and they put it on the Prophet Muhammad and Fatima was called, and she removed them, and he made dua, and he made dua for seven people, and all those seven people were killed instantaneously in the Battle of Badr. The, as, you, as we saw here, the, the strangulation, the, tri the attempted murder we're going to see of the Prophet Muhammad the torture of the people, the killing of Sumayya, the, the, the torturing of Bilal. And obviously we can draw parallels, and this is the first break we're going to have for five minutes. What parallels can we draw between what's happened uh, in Gaza today, for example, in Palestine, and what's, what's the torture that we're, we're describing here in Mecca? Let's have five minutes talking to the person next one, and then we'll come back and, and see what your contributions are, inshallah. All right, so let's, um, the question, just to remind you of the question we were asking is that so far from what we have covered, what kind of uh, areas of similarity do you reckon that there are between what we've seen by the torture of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions in the Meccan period and what we're seeing today, for example, in Gaza? Yes, sir. Uh, so we discussed it in a variety of different aspects. I think the first is to, to give us the the idea and <clears throat> to remind us that this world is cruel, it's unjust mm. um, and what we're seeing now is you could say a continuation of of the nature of this world um, during the Prophet's time as we've, we've been discussing um, the torturing of Bilal, he couldn't do anything about it physically so he had to provide uh, comfort spiritually and I think in that instance as well it improved uh, Bilal radiallahu and whose imam and faith and obviously that led to him being one of the, the greatest companions in our tradition. Um, but yeah, so aside from the kind of looking at it from that perspective about how it's unjust, it gives us the idea as well about resilience in our faith. We can't be Muslims and have it easy. Um, we all get tested. And I think m this period more than any other, um, the Muslims are starting to become a bit more united and starting to look at this issue. Um, and it brings us closer to the faith and look at the people in Gaza, look how close they are to their religion and it puts you know, me personally to shame given the resources that we have and how close they are, the sufferings that they feel from that perspective and uh, yeah, we we're just basically touching on, on these kinds of points uh, mm -hmm. from, a, from a general level. We can go into specifics as well. But no, that's good. Thank you very much. Any other contributions? Um, the same one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so basically, I... Uh, I reflected over the point of who is winning, in particular to Gaza and uh, Israeli war. So just like in Quraysh, they thought they're the winning party, and they were fighting mm, and torturing the that's Muslims. A good, that's a good point. Uh, but eventually, the mm. Muslims prevailed. And even though if they would have, like they lost their life, but technically they did not lose anything, mm -hmm. they, they won again. There was no loss. So similarly, maybe today what's happening in Gaza, we might consider the loss of human beings. Yes, it is lost in a technical sense of worldly life. But if you look at it from Ukhri perspective, it's not really a loss. Beautiful. And eventually, the Muslim will win. Just like how they prevail over the Quraysh. Maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years, maybe 50 years. But the, 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 the winning party are actually us as a Muslim. 
phenomenal, just, phenomenal. Uh, Thank you very much. It's, yes. Uh, what we were talking about as well, as well. It's actually trails. It's like Allah. What we don't understand is Allah has a sunnah. Mm. So mm. we see this. It's like trails of success. Uh, because I always talk about this because we look at it from an ugly perspective. Logically, we're looking and seeing. Sorry, we're looking and seeing kids being massacred, etc. And looking at it from a logical perspective, nobody can come and look at that and say that's success. You can't. Mm. Yani, unless you look at it from a perspective of the naql which is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent, because it goes back to the Treaty of Hudaybiyah as well. And it's very interesting because at the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, the odds were, like, the, the clauses that were made were so against them, it enraged the, so much the companions. If you talk about being <coughs> emotional, the companions were in such a state that the Prophet Sallam, a prophet told them, ordered them to shave their hair, and none of them listened to it. This is, a, this is like, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have, you know, punished nations. But then Allah sent Surah Fat. So it's mm. like, hold on a second, and we have given you clear victory. What... Cl if we, if, if the companions were there, imagine these are the companions, the best people to walk the earth. In that state, they are in a moment of despair. But Allah is telling them, we, I have granted you clear victory. So it goes back to, again, when we look at it from a perspective, Allah has a sunnah. And you see that with what the companions went through from the torture to the death and what carried on for the 13 years plus. But these were just footsteps of foundations of success. That's right. So what we discussed with Mehmet was that, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has that plan and the divine plan like like you said mm -hmm. to us like and also one other thing that it makes me think is how majestic and how Allah is because I have to look at it from a perspective of I'm a human being like like it's, it's not that like if you put yourself not that you put yourself in the place of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but to think of hikmah like I would think these children are martyrs Jannah the Prophet said the one who loses even a child they will run, uh, they will enter Jannah so to me, looking from that perspective, it's a win-win, like you said. Yeah. Tell me where the loss is. It's a win or win. So, yeah, it's just it's just basically the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's a path to victory and we ask that Allah Beautiful. that we see in our time. Beautiful. Just to add on the sunnah as well. Yeah. I mean, if everything was honey and bunny uh, in Islamic yeah. sense, then everybody would be Muslim. Yeah, exactly. So there has to be difficulty to attain certain uh, status, like yeah, uh, yes. in the eyes of Allah SWT, and be in that of value. If you're really a good boxer, yes. you have to suffer to get there. Of course. So yes. Yeah, so exactly. Like you know, you look at them. Like I mentioned this in one video. Um, there was a girl who came to me a couple of years ago in Speaker's Corner, and she was like, "I don't believe in God anymore." I said, mm -hmm. "Why?" She said, "Oh, what's going?" She said specifically, "What's going on in Palestine?" And to me, isn't it amazing? We are in the West, and we have everything. Yeah. yeah. But we sit in our comfy sofas and we get fall into shubhad. One shubhad comes and we're like, our iman is shaken. Yeah. You look at these people and it's very weird, I, I, uh, ironic that you're in your comfy sofa getting shubhad about Islam. These people, bombs are dropping on them and they've got, the in iman is increasing. Well, I mean, uh, I don't know if, um, um, I think I did mention it to you. And I'll just show you again because it's, I, I found it fascinating when I... The, the woman with you, right? Pardon? No, the, 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 the person that I saw uh, who was a European citizen... And um, he was actually in Gaza at the time, yeah. and he actually even showed me, you know, yeah, he showed me the, the papers that they dropped uh, into the people of Gaza, and he even gave me a bit of sand from Gaza because he was there, right? And he's got pictures and videos and stuff of him being in Gaza, and I saw them. But basically, he was saying that exactly what you just said. He said, "I've not seen one person there," and we had a very long conversation. He said, "I've not seen one person to despair." like despairing from the mercy of Allah or despairing he said no one was despairing he said they weren't even upset like there was not even a blame culture mm. like they weren't blaming anyone they, they understood it's like everyone understood that their mindset now has as you mentioned it's, it's being expunged it's, be, it's being prepared but that's, okay, that's crazy you know what one thing I'll say personally from my story there was a time where I can remember I was at home and my dad's a little bit quite a bit hostile towards Islam so he really used very harsh words towards me and it really hurt me and he, I think he kicked me out of the house and I went to the underground and I just I went, I, just to cool down I was on the train Yeah. but I felt this sense of I don't know what it is but you know when you're in the and you can't even bro you can't even that's not even a match to what they're going through but you feel a sense of sweetness of Iman you know when yeah, you're being persecuted yes, yes, it sounds right. weird yeah but yeah, yeah. you feel a sense of persecution like it's like this is for the sake of Allah yeah? and, and what I went through was what my dad, my dad swore at me said some things mm -hmm. and kicked me out of the house and I came back uh, the same day and he let me in. Compare this, it's weird, like uh, like we said before, Allah has these laws that are in place as if like when you go through these persecutions, mm -hmm. it actually makes you stronger, bro. It's, it's weird, it we, you, yeah. cannot, you cannot explain it. And like yeah. you said, bro, it's, you know, these are the, the creme de la creme of the Sahaba. Yes. 
the cream, the mm. top notch Sahabis, yeah. were the ones who actually went through the persecution, were the ones who went through the torture, were the ones who were there from the beginning. To the point where Allah says about them in the Quran, لا يستوي منكم من أنفق من قبل الفتح وقاتل ولائك أعظم درجة من الذين أنفقوا من بعد وقاتل وكل ما على الله الحسن هذا. Non equivalent from you are those who did, who gave in charity before the conquest and fought before the conquest. That they are higher in degree than the ones who uh, did that afterwards, and Allah has put good in all of them. So um, that's fantastic. Really good contributions. Anything from this side of the room? Besides, uh, a little bit close to those, those opinions, I think the, the outcome of the resilience yes. that uh, people in Gaza today, the same the Sahaba at that time, there were very few people, but still the, the, the resilience made the message to be mm. reached out to billions. Mm. So nowadays, I think this caused the, the, the fight in Gaza, the battle in Gaza, it caused many people to convert it to Islam. Mm. So it means it's we see the negative side, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a wisdom wisdom to expose, let's say, the, the positive side. I think it was the Guardian that literally um, done an article. Yeah, yeah. Was it that the Guardian? was a report of Guardian that said that yeah. it made young people in America and every country mm. closer to Islam. And they're yeah. uh, opening Quran to yeah. read about why wow. Wow. those people have this faith and this uh, yeah. qawi iman. So other other part, I think it's very good that we understand Liamiz Allah al Khabisa min al So in today's world, so everybody was misled, especially in our countries. For twenty years, we have been told that we need to uh, impose democracy and m human rights and everything, and many people were uh, let's say dying for it. But today we understand that what's the level of humanity that those people exactly. were applying it for us. So the masks have dropped, really. Yeah, yeah, everything. And at that time, so the mushrikeen, the elites of the Quraysh, they had the same values. Like mm. so we are cultural people. We are, let's say, stick to our rules and everything. But while they were torturing servants for their beliefs, for their, uh, let's say, converting to Islam. So it means that those people who always say that we are uh, good people, yes. so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose yes. them to show the people that they are not good. Similar yeah. yeah. in the Surah Baqarah, right? The, um, no, no, the other one that in the beginning, um, the, the last part. Yeah, that, that's part. No, that's not the ayah. They say that we are actually, they are the one crap. I don't know why I can't recall it now. Oh, yeah, that's 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 we, we are, we are good deals, but rather they. Which one? Started Oh, I'm not sure. 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 I'm not I was feeling the honor, like I've been stopped because I'm Muslim. <laughs> I was kind of honored. Well, a lot of these guys are saying that in Gaza. They're saying we feel honored. Yeah. And and you know, I don't want to connect it explicitly, but yeah. there's there are. But by the way, there's a few hadiths that mention Gaza, the word Gaza on the side of it. Now they're all weak. <laughs> no, but yeah, and still, uh, the hadith mentioned Asqalan. Do you know that city right next to Gaza? Ashkalan, they call it. But it's called Asqalan, and they, a lot of hadiths mention Gaza and Asqalan together. And they mentioned the people in there, the noble people, and all those kind of things. That uh, unfortunately, the hadiths are weak. Uh, but there, there are some Sahih hadiths which talk about the Taifa Mansura, the, the saved sect. That and by the way, this is interesting because people that talk about saved sect, they don't connect all the hadiths together. Because if they do, they realize actually the saved sect are connected with Beit uh, the, 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 the the what do you call it, Masjid Al Aqsa, Beit Al Maqdis. Is co connected with the people in the Levant and stuff like that, and what's happening in the Levant. And it's going to be on the in the Malaham al Kubra and the end of days and stuff. There's going, they're going to be there and so on. But I don't want to connect it uh, explicitly because we don't, we can't do that. But what I'm saying is that there's something, something's going on here, and it seems to me like it's tamheed, it's, it's a preamble, it's a uh, preparation even for some greater things to happen, because this is the same thing that happened with the early Muslims. And look what these early Muslims ended up doing. Throughout the history. Throughout the history, bro. So I'm, I'm going to read out another hadith because that was a good, really good session there. I think that we, it was nice. 
everyone's contributions were fantastic. I just want to make read this hadith again because I, I did it in a in a way which I think was um, a little bit ambiguous. Which uh, number is this? No, this is not on the slides, but I, I'll read it out anyway. Uh, the one that I mentioned, but I didn't mention exactly the hadith. So it's, this is one of the things. This is one of the areas of they try to humiliate the prophet. They try to degrade the Prophet, where the Prophet ﷺ was in a state of prostration, surrounded by a group of people from Quraysh pagans. Aqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt came to the Prophet ﷺ, the, and he brought the intestines of a camel and threw them over the back of the Prophet. So he's praying, minding his business, Sallallahu and this belligerent uh, thug, this animal, came to the Prophet ﷺ and he tried to put the intestines on his back. Once again, a very cowardly move. This man and his associates are extreme cowards because they always do it when the Prophet's not looking, it's not face-to-face -face confrontation, either they get him from the back and they try and choke him or he's prostrating, he's engaging in, in prayer and worship and he's doing this kind of thing. These people are cowards. The Prophet ﷺ did not raise his head from prostration until Fatima, his daughter. So he's doing this in front of the man's daughter, which is completely ignoble. I mean, this is completely dishonorable behavior. Came and removed these intestines from the back and invoked evil. Uh, on whoever had done the evil deed. The Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Allah, destroyed the chiefs of Quraysh. Oh Allah, destroyed Abu Jahl ibn Hashim, Atba ibn, uh, ibn Rabi'ah, Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, Aqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, Umayya ibn Khalaf. And all of the, and this is, well, listen to this, it's amazing. He said, later on I saw, and this is the Rawi of the Hadith mentioning this, yeah? He said, later on I saw all of them killed during the Battle of Badr and their bodies were thrown into a well except the body of Umayya or obey because he was a fat person. This is literally the hadith. And when he was pulled, the parts of his body got separated before he was thrown into the well. SubhanAllah, and this shows you like the justice comes. And sometimes the justice comes agile and sometimes it comes agile. Sometimes it comes straight away and sometimes it comes after a while. But either way, the justice comes. And another thing which I find fascinating is now we're on slide 10 of the hadith of Khabbab ibn Arat. This is an extremely important hadith, especially if we're talking about, and we're going to speak a little bit more detail about this in the slides that will come, the Western methods of psychological treatment. Because look, look at this, right? Khabbab ibn Arat reported the following, that we, we complained to the Prophet Muhammad while he was leaning upon his rolled up cloak in the shade of the Kaaba. We said, will you ask Allah to help us? Will you supplicate to Allah for us? The Prophet ﷺ stated, Among those before you, a, believe, a believer would be seized, a ditch would be dug for him, and he would be thrown into it. Then they would bring a saw that would uh, be put on top of his head and they would split him into two halves, and his flesh would be torn from the bone with iron combs. Yet all of this did not cause them to abandon their religion. By Allah, this religion will prevail until a rider travels from Yemen to Hadramaut, fearing no one but Allah and the wolf, lest it uh, trouble his sheep. Rather, you are being impatient. Now, imagine the following. Imagine you go to a um, counseling session and you go to one of the talk, talk and cure therapy people or the CBT people or whoever it may be. And you say, listen, I've had such and such trauma take place in my life, this and that, whatever, yeah? And then the counselor responds. He says, look, this would happen to that person, this would happen to that person, you're being a bit impatient here. Now, that would be seen as almost malpractice. That would be seen as it's, it's unthinkable that this, something like this would happen. Now, by the way, I mean, this would happen in the early 20th century. And I saw some videos of Carl Jung, who was one of the psychoanalysts, his, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this to you before, but he, basically his clients would come to him and he would actually trigger them on purpose. And on one particular woman, she has a video online of her saying like, he would trigger me on purpose and because he wanted to get to her psyche and the, and the shadow side and stuff and he wanted to, to make her angry. And then the guy asked her, why are you going back to him? She goes, because she, she discovers that she, she wants to know more about her shadow, but she didn't say that, but effectively that's what's going on. The point is, is that sometimes it's, it's a good psychological practice to compare your situation with those who have a worse life. And the Prophet ﷺ gave us direct instruction of that. Yeah. 
look at those, he said, Prophet is telling us, who are less than you in dunya, who have less than you. And don't look at those who have more than you, because when you do that, then you can deny the, the blessings of Allah. Sometimes it's important to realize that other human beings in history and in the present have gone through more difficult times. And that's why when we're seeing the situation in Gaza, most of our problems become trivialized. And sometimes we feel ashamed about, like, like for example, so, some of the tribulations I'm going through and the, the petty, trivial, minuscule things that happen in my life. After you see, a, and the Prophet mentioned the baby, uh, a person being cut in two. We've seen children being cut in two now. Yes. Another thing is that, for example, me and Mehmet was mentioned, the second point was, uh, like, we look at the Sahaba and what they went through. So, like you said, the hadith that you talked about. But very interestingly, I don't know if this is authentic, but was it Bilal Radhi'an who came to the Prophet Sallam and complained? And he said, nations before you had their skins. No, this is the hadith. I've just, just mentioned it. Habab Arat, yeah. Oh, okay, good. So, you see how the Prophet mentioning the previous nations before them. Yes. So, we're using the Sahaba for our situation, be grateful. And at the time of the Sahaba, the process remind them about a previous nation before them. Yes. So it's a prophetic um, way of, you know, reminding each other. About the hadith is before. what we just read now, Habab and Arat. Yeah. And he said that you they would get combs of uh, metal and they would be, yeah. and he said, we shak and Sfain, and you would cut into two. So, so I'm not saying there's no benefit in CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, or psychoanalytic approaches or anything else. I'm saying that Sometimes, if you just sit there and talk about your problems for an hour, and a guy is nodding along and pretending to care, without the guidance element, without someone telling you, actually, you know, pull up your socks, my friend, people have gone through worse, it makes for a weak people and a weak environment. Yeah. Let me say, you know, we're looking at this, uh, it's, uh, I think it's very traumatic for us because it's the first time a genocide is happening on TV, so we're seeing the, the raw of it. But when we look back at the history of Islam, like, we can see far worse has happened in terms of shackling the the ummah baghdad when the mongols destroyed it um the prophet uh, uh sira when we understood the battles that he was uh uh undertaking battle of buddha uh mm. where if they got defeated islam would wouldn't exist for example so i think not to take any uh pain away from what's happening because what happened what is happening is uh, a genocide quite frankly but um looking back and using this method from a macro lens as well it, it works from and uh, may i add you can look at it from another perspective which is that the, the prophet told us that there will be people in the future that basically will rival the sahabis yeah. in terms of their prestige yeah. and i never was thought it, was it 50 to 1? yeah i mean but sometimes these kind of ratios are used by in the Arabic language, it's just a matter of hyperbole, yeah, like, like 170, 50. So we have to look at the shurahat of that. But basically the point is, is that that could never be possible. The opportunity for these kinds of posts and these kinds of stations could never be given unless this kind of severe kind of punishment was inflicted. That's the only way you can be r raised like that. You know, you know what I find interesting? Yeah. Sometimes you go to these, you know these entrepreneurship, you know, you go and the guy's in a suit, and he gives like he tells his life story like yeah, mm -hmm. you know ten years ago I used to eat just toast and beans, and then he talks about his life story and I lived in the floor and I slept on the floor, and then people listen 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 and then he talks about his success story, so he talks about all the stuff that he went through, and then where he is now, and people actually they glorify yeah. that and they're like that's amazing oh my gosh this guy yeah. came from there. And they're proud of that. Yeah, why can't the same happen with uh, trials and uh, things we're going through? Why Absolutely. can it be seen as a form of that's actually amazing? But we do the opposite. Mm. We actually think. If it's you know, if you got it easy, but it's something that's rewarding, you know, in the sense it makes you who you are. All these stories you'll hear it. I was doing this and I was working in this shop. They would give me one pound fifty an hour, and he's telling all this story. And then he's like, yeah, then I made it. It's it's these things like you know Allah says in the Quran, fa inna usra yusra. With hardship comes ease, and I think the problem that we face today in the West is exactly that. Because I always talk about this because if with hardship comes ease, the opposite has to be truth. With ease comes hardship. Mm -hmm. We are so immersed in ease that we have hardship in the long run. But rather, if we went through the hardship now, we'll have ease, ease in the long run. Mm. And that's why I believe with this whole psychological, mental this and mental that, I believe all stems to this, bro. We, are, we have life so easy that when we are touched by a little calamity, our whole life falls apart. And that's mm. what makes a difference from the people of Gaza. I think that's a fantastic contribution. And uh, it leads me to the next slide, uh, slide number 12. Yeah, back, of course. Can you repeat the bit where you said, you're not saying that psychological methods don't work, but... 
uh, it's very important to have what? I missed that bit. So, I'm so trying to uh, yeah, so I'm saying that, like, you know, let me put it another way, and we'll talk about this in the two or three slides from now. But you have to understand that every psychological school of thought, whether it's behavioral psychology or psychoanalysis or whatever it may be, right? It, just like in science, it has presuppositions and assumptions. Every single one of them. And those assumptions could be true and could be false. Let me give you an example. Look at psychoanalysis. It's the most famous and probably the most respected uh, school of psychology in the West, right? And maybe in the world, actually. And it has front run, as we mentioned, Carl Jung, but also people like Freud, right? And it has certain uh, assumptions. And the assumptions relate to the unconscious mind. It's not the subconscious mind, but it's the unconscious mind. Uh, the psyche, or what, what Jung refers to as the psyche, the, the shadow, the id ego, the super ego. There's all these phrases that they have. Psychosexual development. One of them is um, how you are basically raised as a child. So if you, like, I, this, I don't want to generalize, but if you go and do talking cure with some counselor that's well-versed in psychoanalysis, they, their assumption is, look, let's go to this guy's youth. Most of his problem goes back to his upbringing. And that comes from the fact that they believe that most of your, the unconscious drivers and stuff have been formed in your early development through psychosexual development and through unconscious taking in of information and so on. Now, these assumptions haven't been, uh, I would say, they, ha they have been criticized, but not to a level where we can say, okay, they've been completely rejected. And so we're going with those assumptions, but the truth of the matter is, like, we don't know to what extent these assumptions are actually true. And like Karl Popper said, that psychology is, is a pseudoscience. So it doesn't, it will never reach even a the, the scientific level. And the scientific level has problems as well, under determinism and theory-ladenness and, and all these kinds of things that we, we've spoken about in the philosophy of science. So imagine if these are the problems of science, imagine the kind of issues that we have with psychology, which is a pseudoscience, according to Karl Popper. So the point is, is that when we're talking about a school, a, a, a school of thought within psychology, there's layers of speculation here that we have to assume with, when it comes to the assumptions of these schools. Having said all of that, I'm not saying that someone who does talking th therapy or whatever is unlikely to get any good results. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that the Islamic method, if you look at the hadith, and I don't think this has been developed properly yet. It hasn't, in my estimation. It hasn't. I've not seen any good Islamic theories that have come out yeah, on psychology. Yeah? But the Islamic method, if you look at hadith like the one of Khabbab and Arat, it's clear that it's not in full cooperation with the psychoanalytic method in, 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 in prescription, especially how it's being done now with all this um, moral relativism effectively that's being surrounding it. Like uh, there's a particular show called The Sopranos, a very famous show in the 1980s, 80, I don't know, 90s or something, yeah? And the man was sitting down with the psychologist. You know, I used to watch this show when I was a youngster. And then when I became older, I watched it again. No, I'm joking. So, <laughs> but anyway, she was there and she was talking to him and he's talking all these kind of things. And I remember, even as a young man, this particular episode, I think it must have been in the first season or something because I didn't watch the second season, where one character said to another character, speaking to the woman, the, the psychology woman, she said to her, because she was, she was effectively treating Tony Soprano, the, the main character, the bad guy, yeah? And he said that you, he was effectively questioning her morality and saying, you're helping a, a criminal, effectively. Like, the more you help him, the more you're going to kill people. And because of, and he mentioned moral relativism, you, you, your profession doesn't allow you to say you're right and you're wrong. It's objectionable to say you're right and you're wrong in a psychological saying. You, they want non-judgmentality. But that's not going to solve their problem. Non-judgmentality is not going to solve their problem. Sometimes people need to be judged. Maybe someone needs to stand next to Tony Soprano and tell him, my friend, maybe your problems and your guilt and your this and your that is because you're killing people. Maybe you need to stop killing people. I don't think there's one episode where she said that to him. Why you stop killing people? You're wrong. Instead, no, but why are you having these bad dreams? Why are you doing this and why that? Maybe you have this and all these indirect words. 
That's not uh, Islamic psychology. That's uh, nonsense. That's helping the criminal. And the guy was right in that episode. So these are areas where we disagree with uh, the moral relativistic uh, things. But before, you, before I come to you, I just want to mention something because a lot of you did allude to this, but I think it's important to mention some of the ayahs in the Quran that relate to this. So for example, one of them is Alif Lamim. In Surah Ankabut, chapter 29, verses 1, 2, 3. That Alif Lam Mim, do people think that they will be left alone to say, I believe, and that they will not be trialed? Connected to this verse is the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَحَسِبُتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقَنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ that do you think that we have created you aimlessly and that you're not going to come back to us? And this other verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is connected, أَمْ حَسِبُتُمْ أَنْ تَدُخُلُوا الْجَنَّةَ وَلَمَّا يَعْلَمِ اللَّهُ مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ خَلَوْا مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ مَسَّتْهُمُ الْبَأْسَاءُ وَالضَّرَّاءُ وَزُلْزِلُوا حَتَّى يَقُولَ الرَّسُولُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُ مَتَى نَصْرُ اللَّهِ أَلَا uh, did you think that you were going to go into Jannah? And what happened to the people that came before you is not going to happen to you? That Masatum al and the calamity and tribulation afflicted them to the point where even the Prophet among them and those who believed said, Where? Or when is? When is the Nasr of Allah? The help of Allah. And then Allah responds to the question immediately and says, Allah in the Nasr of Allah qarib. And this very important and interesting verse in Surah Al Ahzab. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, states, وَلَمَّا رَأَى الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الْأَحْزَابِ قَالُوا هَذَا مَا وَعَدَنَا اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ وَصَدَقَ اللَّهُ رَسُولُهُ uh, وَمَا زَادَهُمْ إِلَّا إِيمَانًا وَتَسْلِيمًا That when they saw, and this is Ahzab, we're going to speak about it in more detail, inshallah, when the khandaq. When they saw the people, they said, this is what Allah and the Messenger promised us. What, what did they promise us? If you look at tafsir of this ayah, it's saying that they were promised that they would be tested. They knew that they would be tested. So, as so, so imagine this, subhanAllah, and we're talking about Gaza. Effectively, Allah is telling us that these people, when the tribulation came, it made them go up in Iman. That it made them become better Muslims when the tribulation came. When they were being surrounded from all sides. إِذْ جَاءُوكُمْ مِنْ فَوْقِكُمْ مِنْ أَسْفَلَ مِنْكُمْ وَإِذْ زَاغَتِ الْأَبْصَارِ وَإِذْ بَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرَةِ وَتَظُنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ أَذْظُنُونَ where, the, where they were coming from above you and below you and beside you and all this kind of things and your hearts reached your throats. So this is what Allah is saying. At this point, they were increased in Iman. At this very point. So one of the hikam, one of the wisdoms of torture and trauma that happens, whether it's historically or contemporaneously, is the fact that the people increase in al-Iman, in al-Tawakkul, in al-Shukr. And on the point of Shukr, a very famous hadith, uh, which everyone should know. Very. Uh, before we get to that, in fact, there is a flip side, which the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Hajj. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ حَرْفِ فَإِنْ أَصَابَهُ خَيْرٌ اتْمَأَنَّ بِهِ when Asabatu fitna tun in Kalab ala wajihi khasar dunya wala khasir dunya wala khira. There are some people who worship Allah on the edge. Literally, harf means the edge. If so they they're not grounded and they don't have solid iman. These people, they're worshipping Allah on the edge. Anything that's gonna happen to them, any trauma, that's it. They're gonna leave Islam. They're gonna their faith is gonna drop. But first, when Asabahu Khairat Ma Nabi, if he's if if good things happen to him in his life, he's happy with it. He's content with that. When Asaba to fitna, and if bad things happen, he falls on or he falls back on his heels, he basically falls off the, the thing, and he loses the dunya, the this world, and the hereafter. Very interesting. Khasira dunya. He doesn't just lose the hereafter, he loses this dunya as well. Khasira dunya wal akhira. Because despairing has no survival function functionality. Can it not mean to interdebor? Can it not mean that that person's like you said it was on the edge, like you said anything good that happens, it's it, 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 the the iman has to be tied to the worldly things. Can it not be because yeah, for example, they lost some money. 
Oh man, did you get it? Yes. So, and the fact that they their iman is shaken and they fall off, it's pertaining to the dunya. And Allah saying you're gonna yes. lose that which you That's left right. it for. That's right. Maybe. I'm Subhan- sure. No, it's right. It's like it's saying that if good things happen, he's happy with it. But yeah. all it takes is one calamity. There's one verse in the Quran, in Surah Tawbah, that certainly in the fitna, they fell. Yeah. Literally, that's the, the ayah. Or it's a part of the ayah. They fell in the, the fitna. Yes. And this is interesting because this is a psychological assessment. In the insana khuliqa haluan, that certainly the human being has been created in a state of anxiety and panic. When evil touches him, then he, be, he becomes panicked. Yeah. And when the good things happen to him, he's preventative, stingy, doesn't want to give that away, except for the ones who pray, and then there's a list of attributes accompanying that. But the Prophet ﷺ tells us the true believer, that certainly wondrous is the affair of the believer. In namrahu kullahu lahu khayrun. That certainly all of his, uh, his affair is good. And that, And this is not the case for anyone except for the believer. In If good things happen to him, he's happy, happy with that. And he's thankful with that. That, that was good for him. And if bad things happen to him, he's patient, resilient, and that was good for him. So uh, the, the Prophet ﷺ keeps saying, being resilient, being patient is good for you, effectively. Can, can, can I ask yeah, you yeah. This? You know, um, so what we've said so far is like being tested and going through torture and that boosts our iman. That's because we're already Muslim. It can do. As we said, there's some people that are winning the edge. Yeah, some people are on the edge and, mm. you know, anything that goes wrong, they're like, you know what? Maybe Islam's not right. Exactly. That's what happens to yeah. them. So what about the non-believers? Like what, what about them when they go through tests? Do they look for a being that's greater? Or is it that they hate it more? Uh, well, look, I mean, uh, they're not one. Uh, the Non-Muslims are not one uh, kind of, uh, there's not one size fits all for all of them. But we do know in the Quran, it says, يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ إِلَّا الفاسقين. That Allah, he, he, he misguides with it, i.e. the Quran itself. And Allah misguides with the Quran. Someone can look at the Quran and say, this is not for me. And someone can look at the Quran and say, yes, this is the guidance. And he doesn't, and the ones who are misguided from it are not, none but the evildoers. So it depends uh, where they stand, where the, how pure their heart is, effectively. That's well, usually we can agree that it is calamities that draw people to some kind of a divine source. It's always calamities. You'll hear stories. It can do. It really can, it's, yes. The majority of the time, you rarely see people who have blessings when they come close to Allah. And I'm talking Muslims and non-Muslims. Mm. It's usually calamities. You speak to many people. This person died. I lost this. I lost my money. It's usually calamities, bro. That's what Allah yeah. says. You might hate something which is good. Well, I mean, the thing is, Allah says in the Quran, you know, وَبَلَوْنَاهُمْ بِالْحَسَنَاتِ وَالسَّيَّاتِ لَعَلَهُمْ يَرْجَعُونَ That we have certainly trialed them with good things and bad things so that they can come back. Yes. So it's like to, te- to bring everyone in and to give everyone a fair chance, yeah. we'll give you provision, we'll give you good health, we'll give you this and that. If, you do, if that doesn't work, let's give, let's give you a bit of difficulty in your life. Also, if that doesn't work, then we've tried everything with you. Effectively. We have an ayah that says we send a calamity to divert a bigger calamity. So this is, the, the tafsir says that this is talking, the, the bigger calamity is hellfire. The smaller calamity is things that Allah sends, loss of life, business, yeah, so, the, exactly. so, that, so that you may turn. So all of this is, yeah. what you're, sh- you're saying is good because it's, it's showing us that Calamities can be used to, uh, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring people closer to his religion, to make people remember him, to, to, to strengthen. And there's another issue is, which is tamhis, to expunge and to purify the sins of the believers. Yeah. So there's lots of wisdom, spiritual benefits of calamities. But I want to just touch upon modern psychological theories, because we've kind of touched upon that already, but let's go on to that. The question of what is resilience, and I've mentioned this in the beginning, according to Christine Stevens, she says the ability to cope mentally and emotionally with a crisis and to return to pre-crisis status quickly. That's how she understands uh, um, resilience. Now, there's a difference between resilience and what's referred to as trait resilience. Now, there's five major traits, as we know, the big five and all that. I'm not sure if you've heard of the big five. 
you've probably heard of that, which is trait openness, conscientiousness, extraversion, agreeability, and uh, neuroticism. It's, it's, it's um, summarized in the acronym OCEAN. OCEAN, yeah? This is what, in modern day psychology, a lot of people use these five measures. But there are other traits as well. So trait resilience is usually juxtaposed with what you call neuroticism. So a neurotic person is somebody who, when they're, when they're faced with certain difficulties, they always have negative emotions. So they always have pessimistic mindset. If something bad happens to them, they, they can't handle it. They find it difficult. They're complaining all the time. They're, they always see things in a negative manner. So juxtaposed to trait uh, neuroticism is trait resilience, which is the opposite. You can handle that. It's not a problem. And as you mentioned, it's, it is true that people that have, haven't faced a lot of difficulty in their life are less likely to be resilient. That is a fair assessment. And so that's why people go to gyms nowadays and do martial arts and do extreme sports, because they realize that if they don't put their self through that, that life will put them through that. And it's better for them to voluntarily do that in their own, on their own terms than have life do that for them on terms which are not theirs. Do you see, do, that's effectively how, like Bruce Lee said, you know, I, I don't pray to God to, make, to give me a comfortable life or an easy life. I pray to God to give me the strength to deal with a difficult life. And the same kind of principle applies. So that's the, um, the idea of resilience. And interestingly, there is another idea which is called allostasis. Now, allostasis is, you might have heard of homeostasis, which is the idea of balance and so on. But allostasis is the idea that when the difficulty increases, that you are always able to keep a balance. So, for example, if we were to meet to on a physiological level, if we were to um, measure our heart rates right now, maybe it's 70 to 80 to 90, whatever it may be, right? But then if I go on a treadmill, if we all go on a treadmill, then our heart rates will increase. But if we go, keep going on the treadmill, then even on the treadmill, our heart rates will reduce as compared to if we didn't go on the treadmill for that long. If that makes sense. So it's your ability to moderate yourself effectively. Now, these are very important things that modern people have not been able to do. Because as you mentioned, Ali, it's like, you know, we're weakened by the forces around us. So once again, the only way to... It's a blessing in a sense. I know this sounds maybe almost facetious or insensitive. But calamities can be a blessing. There's benefits that come from calamities, which is that it gives you the opportunity to build this, this resilience. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, sabr bit tasabbur. Very interesting hadith. Innam al ilm bit al hilm bit wa sabr bit tasabbur. That certainly the process of acquiring knowledge, the, the process of becoming more knowledgeable is through the acquisition of knowledge. And the process of being more forbearing or more in control of your emotions, because helma has two meanings really, is by being put into situations where that needs to be the case. And the process of being more patient and resilient is, is being able to practice patience and resilience. So patience and resilience is not a theoretical exercise. It's like swimming. You don't learn to swim by being outside of the water. You need to get into the water to learn how to swim. Likewise, you cannot learn to be resilient and sabir and shakir and properly patient and thankful unless you're put into the situation. When you say, for example, talking about non-Muslims, we can, hardship can only be good for us if we ask Allah's aid. Because if you look at it, the disbeliever is patient. Patient on what? With, with what? Do you get what I'm trying to say? So can it That's a good that point, Lotus. That's a good point. Because it has to be connected to Allah because the patience, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's from that. Because otherwise, yeah. you look at a disbeliever, like a, a Muslim goes through cancer, a disbeliever goes through cancer. Mm. We both go and through that's, trials. We were talking before we started this session about what Viktor Frankl, we talked about different Western psychological me methods. I think the best one for, that I like anyway, personally, and I think which is closest to Islam, is the one of Viktor Frankl. Now, Viktor Frankl cited his own school of thought effectively called Logotherapy. And, logo, and he wrote this book about, what's it called, The Meaning of... Uh, yeah, A Man's Search for Meaning. A Man's Search for Meaning, right? It's a very famous book because he was a Holocaust survivor. Yeah, yeah he was a Holocaust survivor because some Holocaust survivors were exterminated, some Holocaust people were exterminated, some people were survived the extermination and the liquidation. He was one of those survivors. So he wrote a book called 
uh, Man's Search for Meaning. And in that book, he's talking about how religious people, religious Jews effectively, because they would have to be, I think, were able to find meaning in the pain. And he said that those were the people who were able to survive the onslaught of the situation best. And we're seeing the same thing manifest itself in Palestine and in Gaza, where we're seeing the people who can deal with the situation best are those who have been able to transform their mindset into a mindset of, okay, well, if they die, they're martyrs. And we see these incredible scenes of people dying and then people celebrating the martyrdom. Yes, of course, they're sad, but in a sense, there's a kind of ambivalence there because they're also, well, congratulations, you're a martyr. And so we make, this, this is the most effective way in which death and suffering can be transformed into something greater. Hence, Viktor Frankl's school of thought of logotherapy is probably the closest thing to the Islamic paradigm. Because it's, it's saying this, it's saying that if you don't have meaning to the pain, the pain is frivolous, as you mentioned. It's not something which is, uh, you can never, whatever amount of antidepressants you decide to take or uh, therapy sessions, it's never going to be the same as a narrative setting exercise where there's deep and objective meaning given to the pain and the death that you're going through. There's nothing, you, there's nothing the West has to offer. Let me just give it to you from the end. The, 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 the West has nothing to offer and all psychological methods have nothing to offer. In fact, on the issue of antidepressants, we, we, I was looking at the effect, effectuality of antidepressants and what they try and do is manipulate your, neuro, your neurotransmitters. I mean, you have about six neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin and so on. And some of them um, try and manipulate the serotonin and some of them try and manipulate the dopamine. But effectively, that's what we're dealing with here. The question is, do they work? So I looked at some of the studies. I think the, the most compelling one in the United Kingdom is one where they took, uh, they, they, they gave people a placebo drug and they gave some other people the S. So SR, what's, it, what's, the, what's the abbreviation? The serotonin inhibitors, SR, is it SRIs? I can't remember, the serotonin something inhibitors. The, the serotonin antidepressants. Yeah. Serotonin receptor inhibitors. Yes, uh, SR. SRI. S or something at the end uh, of it. SSRIs. SSRIs, there you go, thank you very much, perfect. Yeah, so they gave them the SSRIs, right? So there's a host of different drugs, of SSRI antidepressants. And then they, and then they asked them basically, how do you feel? What's interesting is that 25% of people that took the placebo drug, they actually, um, they actually reported feeling better. Now, the people who took the drug was 50%. So there was as much, Yanni, there was as much um, disparity between the placebo and nothing, and then between the antidepressants and the placebo, which shows you that there's a cognitive thing going on here, there's a mindset thing going on. It has to be. It's not only with psychological issues, it's with everything. Like any kind of um, disease for that matter, they always implement the placebo effect. Anything. It can be an eye condition, it can be whatever. They just, just to show, does the human brain... The causation. Uh, causation. Does it have like... And, and they've, they've seen it many times. Like, yes. You know. yeah. But the, the point is, is that if, we're, if, if, if the antidepressant has decisive effect, then why is this effect equivalent to the placebo effect, which shows you this whole thing is a mindset issue. It's a, it's a, it's a cognitive issue, more so than it is a neuro. More so than it is a chemical issue, effectively, or neuro uh, transmitter issue, or, or a serotonin issue, or a dopamine issue. It's more of a mindset issue. It's more of a narrative setting issue. And interestingly, we've heard this uh, this abbreviation PTSD. It's PTSD. This famous book. I actually read this book. One of the you know books on this issue that I read cover to cover it was very famous. It's called uh, uh, "The Body Keeps Score." Very famous book. I mean, this by uh, Van der Kolk. Anyway, he was the guy who just started up this whole kind of like uh, you know I don't know laboratories or centers for PTSD. And PTSD, I mean, they really kind of discovered this this condition in the First World War after the First World War. And then afterwards, they started all these scientific experimentations with it. And I'm not saying it doesn't exist. Of course it does. But what is interesting is that there's something called PTG, which many people haven't heard of. But it's got as much, I'm not going to say as much, but it certainly has peer-reviewed uh, stuff on it. And you can just write PTG. And what does PTG stand for? Post-traumatic growth, you see. It's a very interesting uh, concept. So PTSD and PTG. 
But it goes back to the ayah that we were mentioning. That you can have one event and it can have two opposite effects on a human being. Why is it the case that some people, the death of the fire, you were just saying, uh, Ali, you were mentioning, for example, this you can have a calamity and will it lead the disbeliever to Islam? Will it not lead them to Islam? Will it make them think more positively? Will it make them pessimists and nihilists? The answer is, it really depends on the human being. That's the answer. Like you can have a hundred people and of, they all have the same calamity. 20% of them have PTG, 20% of them have PTSD and maybe another 20% of them have com like mixed PTD, PTG and PTSD symptoms. Like, do you know what I mean? Even though they're contradictory, but in, in some areas and times they can have these and there's some areas and times they can have these. Because what is PTG? It's thinking about things in a positive manner. Now, this is in psychological literature to be contrasted, or at least not, it's not the same thing, because I was reading this myself, as resilience. Because someone can confuse it and say, well, resilience and PTG is the same thing. You, the, the difference being is that in PTG, there has to be some kind of calamity. And that after the calamity, you have a different mindset now because of the calamity. Whereas with resilience, it's you're getting stronger because of situations that happen in your life. So there's a slight difference, but they're both connected, these, uh, these things. What Islam is trying to foster and encourage, from a psychological perspective, Islam is trying to foster and encourage all the positive things. The Prophet ﷺ liked fa'l. He liked the idea of uh, at tafa'ul. At tafa'ul it means optimism. At tasha'um in Arabic it means pessimism. So Islam is a, literally a hadith that says that he likes optimism. Anything to do with positivity, looking at the world in a positive manner, looking at the world in, in a good thing, everything is good. Any you can hate something that's good for you. This idea is to be etched in gold from, from the Islamic perspective. So that's, uh, these, are th these are things we should be focusing on. Like, for example, I was looking at an article, and this is apparently what PTG fosters. It, it fosters appreciation of life, relationship with others, new possibilities in life, personal strength, spiritual change, they mention. Spiritual change. And the idea is, that's how we should react. We should be pushing ourselves and telling our people to, if the negative thing happens, like in Gaza or anywhere else, because it's not just the people in Gaza that are being affected by it, it's everyone else outside, that we need to look at this in a positive way. That's the best way forward. Psychologically, that's the best way forward. The best way forward is to, to try to create optimism out of this. Because, because grieving and being sad and all these kind of things it has its limitation. In Islam, it does have its limitations. Of course, you're going to have to grieve sometimes and cry and lay it out and all these kind of things. And uh, interesting, Imir al Qais, who was the uh, poet of the hour, which is his best poet of all time, in fact. And he was talking about his lover that he broke his, uh, she broke his heart and stuff, and he was crying about it. And in the beginning of his poem, he says, I don't know if this tear is going to relieve what I have or it's going to make it worse. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if you read that. Uh, but I don't know if this tear that's being shed here is, is actually going to relieve relieve me here or is going to make things a situation worse. And the, and the answer to Imir al Qais is that it will make things worse if you keep doing it. But if you do it a little bit, it's okay. So there's a limitation. And that's why when someone dies in Islam, it's three days of mourning. And then after that, come on, get back into life. Get back on the horse. Yeah, we have protocols of how to deal with these situations. Protocols. This person's a shaheed. Yes, we cry. Yes, whatever. But we have to get back on the horse. Because otherwise, if we're going to get defeated, we're going to get defeated. If we think, oh, how many people of ours are dying and how many things is happening and this and that, we're going to get defeated. We need to get back into the mindset of... If death is not the, the worst thing that can happen to you. And that everything is good in a way. That's the mindset that allows Islam to spread and conquer. And win. It's not the mindset of defeatism. And sitting there next to a, a counsellor for, for two hours. And talking talk about your problems every, every day. And there's no encouragement or upliftment. Yeah, that's okay. You can go to the counsellor. I'm not saying it's haram. Go to the counsellor. But if that's the only thing you're doing. And taking the antidepressants and stuff. Because many Muslims are into this kind of thing. I'm saying, look. That's fine to a certain level. But if this is the only thing you're relying upon, it's not work for them. And it won't work for them. What's going to work is meaning, purpose, narratives, meta-narratives. And, and the thing is, sadly, we think that that is abnormal. A lot of people question their iman when they're in this situation, they're in despair. Mm. You look at, look at the Prophet ﷺ, even though we said some of the things were weak in the sense where he wanted to commit suicide, like he wanted to, you know, and some say it's authentic in that sense, but it's, I think this is very powerful, even Maryam, السلام, where she said, I wish I died. Yeah, yeah. Okay, who, who say, you would expect, you read the Quran and expect her to say, 
Yeah, alhamdulillah, no problem. Yeah, like sh she's saying, I wish I literally died and f was for long forgotten. So it shows us that this is normal. Even when the Prophet Sallallahu son died and they said, oh, mashallah, and why are you yeah. crying? He said, oh, am I here? These, these yes. things are normal. It's normal. It's, it's normal being pain in doubt. Like you mentioned Surah Ahzab in the verse you didn't finish, but it clearly said, and the, the, the hearts re reached the throats and they started to think all sorts of things about Allah. They, 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 they was mm. that, you know, we don't know what that means by what did they think about Allah was the promise. We don't know. But the point is what? It's natural to have these things to come to your mind, to think this stuff. Yeah. But at the end, Allah will aid you. This is what. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, I mean, sometimes the Sahabis <laughs> in the Quran are actually dispraised, not dispraised, but they're kind of reprimanded. Like, like in Surah Al Amran, it's like they were closer to Kufr that day than Iman, like, for example. Yeah, so, but. Yeah, yeah, but uh, um, I would take, I wouldn't take that as a thing to, like the, those particular ayahs, I wouldn't say that let's follow those, like in terms of... It's not about follow, it's yeah. human nature, okay, the matter is not about follow, like sometimes yeah. when we say this, we're even being careful, the point is this, they were human beings, mm. and these things did happen, of course. it happened to the prophets, and you made a people. good point about Maryam, because I think that's a, that's yes, a, the, the, the people that. embrace yeah. it and be like, what I'm going through is normal, mm. it's not always going to be like that, and I ask Allah's aid. But people think mm. the moment, people fall into more depression by thinking that them being in depression is a punishment exactly. from Allah. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, that's that we mentioned before as well. That there's no one, and this is very interesting because in, in uh, a lot of the mental health issues, people become, there's something called suicide ideation. People become suicidal, some people become, lose hope completely. And that level of hopelessness is not allowed in Islam, especially if it's hopelessness of the mercy of Allah. Mm. Because this ayah is way more, uh, no one completely loses hope in the mercy of Allah except the disbelievers. Uh, yeah. So what, what is being said here is, I think you're right to mention there's a balance. There's a balance is that, for example, إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ That certainly I narrate my beth, my, my despair, or not my despair, but my sadness and my husband my my deep sadness to Allah you know this is Yaqub mentioning when he was crying for his son and all this kind of thing so certainly there was expressions of grief and sadness and that that's natural and normal no one should be dispraised for that and they sometimes should be allowed to just grieve grieve it out effectively and of course grief is a very complex emotion and there's what you call the stages of grief the six stages of grief and all kinds of things that have been uh, grief is one of those things you have to ride it out However, having said that, there's a degree of, okay, get back on the horse. Let's work now. Let's do, let's do our work. For example, Mar Mariam and Yaqub, both of them started operating in, in society and functioning. They didn't let the, if you like, the sadness debilitate them. So th there was the expression of sadness, like with the Prophet ﷺ and his son. But there was also, there was like, you know, let's get back on it and start working again. And that's the kind of balance we're looking for. Once again, I think there needs to be someone who really comes in and brings these things together and sees what fits in with our narrative and what doesn't. Exposure therapy is an interesting one as well because this, a lot of people say, well, oh, the way to get better at something is just to expose yourself to it. That's something which is now has a lot of backing behind it. If you're scared of spiders, then put the spider on the table and touch the spider and these kind of things. But the same thing applies with a lot of things. That we, A lot of us are afraid to get involved with things because we're afraid. Uh, and Islam is encouraging you to do this kind of thing. To really break, like if, if you're afraid, especially with things which are obligations in Islam. Like this might sound uh, controversial, but there's an ayah in the Quran. I mean... I'm going to be controversial here a little bit, but there's, there's ayahs in the Quran that effectively dispraise and call out uh, believers that are running away from the battlefield, for example, or that they are not they are not interested in fighting for the cause, etc. So, for example, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions in Surah Al-Anfal, says, "Ya ayuha ladina amanu, ida ra'aytum fi'atan." No, not that one. It's "Ya ayuha ladina amanu." That if you find those disbelievers who are fighting you, don't show them your back. Or don't show them their back. 
is except if he's doing it because of his, his tactical thing or but he's going back to one other you know contingent that is out there that's a military contingent then فَقَدْ بَاءَ بِغَضَبِ مِنَ Allah. Certainly that he's, he's, he has earned great anger from Allah. وَمَأْوَاهُ جَهَنَّمَ He's going to the hellfire. وَبِئْسَ الْمَصِيرِ And what a horrible outcome that would be. Like for example in Surah Muhammad وسلم, where وَإِذَا نُزِّلَتْ آيَةٌ مُحْكَمَةٌ وَذُكِرَ فِيهَا الْقِتَالِ رأيت الذين في قلوبهم مرض ينظرون إليك نظر المخشى إليه من الموت عليه من الموت فأولى لهم that if they see if an ayah comes down and fighting is mentioned inside of it you see the people in whose hearts is a disease so Allah is referring to this as a disease of the heart what is that disease cowardice can you imagine because what else could it be it's cowardice رأيت الذين في قلوبهم مرض ينظرون إليك نظر المغشية عليه من الموت. That this coward, effective, or this person with this disease in the heart is looking at you, O Prophet, looking at you like as if he's going to die. فأولى لهم. Now this فأولى لهم, there's a difference of opinion among the professors. What does it mean? Some say it means that it's better for them to fight, and that's the opinion I take. And I don't, wanna, I can't remember the other opinion. فأولى لهم, it's better for them to fight. Or some say it's connected to the next verse, which is Ta'atun wa qawlun ma'roof. Anyway, there's two opinions on the matter. The point is, Islam expects us to function in a certain way. Men and women. Unfortunately, we as men have a crisis because we don't have the opportunity to do these things. And so we might not be able to deal with, with stuff like that. Um, and so we need to really expose ourselves as men if we want to build ourselves and our communities and our societies to frightful situations, even public speaking. We talk about the Prophet Muhammad he went on the mountain and he said, oh people, if I were to tell you that there was a, that there was a people behind me, there's an army behind me, what would you say? And they said, oh, that we have not found you to be a liar. But him standing in front of the people, moral courage, coming in front and speaking about these issues. And on that point, Obviously, we're going through a very difficult time now in terms of the Palestine issue. And we do need this moral courage. And the only way to get good at it is to do it. That's the exposure therapy that is required. And that is, hopefully, with this episode, we've been able to see. We've been able to see how resilience can be built. How there's hekam, wisdoms. How best to remove depression and anxiety from one's life. Which is through meaning and purpose. And how... Uh, everything leads to the victory of the Muslims. With that, I will conclude. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.